I'm not going to lie, I was slightly nervous, not to preach tonight, but to get introduced by my little brother, because there are a few different avenues he could have gone down for that introduction. But then I thought, why would I be nervous about what he would say? Because he could only describe me as a loving, gracious, kind, older brother, but I love you, Tyler. And hey, I love every single one of you. And it is so nice to be uh, at the Hills Campus where I started attending with my parents as a four-year-old boy. And um, I've been coming to church my whole life and I love our church. And also I've got a shout out to everyone online. And I don't know if you know, we have one of our rowdiest campuses, not just in Australia, but in the world. We have Hobart that have joined in tonight. So Eddie and Rach, some of my best friends and I, Love you guys, but um, the truth is I've been coming to church pretty much every Sunday since I was four years old. And I've got to be honest, there may have been one or two times where I might not have felt like going. But what I can tell you is there's never been one time that I've ever left coming to church regretting that I came. And that is because, yes, we're here to have fun and we get to sing and see our friends and have community. But ultimately, this moment is about encountering Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I've encountered Jesus and He has absolutely transformed my life. So tonight I have so much faith that God wants to speak to each and every one of us. It's incredible. We don't all know each other's story or where we came from or where we might be heading back tomorrow or even tonight. But what I do know is that there is this God in heaven and He created each and every one of us. and He knows you and He loves you and He hasn't put you here by accident and the season that you might be in right now might be confusing and might not make sense, but God is still God and He's in control. And I wanna encourage you as we open up God's Word, I'm gonna say a few things, but at the end of the day tonight, the Word of God can completely transform our lives tonight. And I don't know about you, I have faith that God can speak in this place tonight. That maybe you have a troubled mind right now, but I believe God is wanting to bring peace into each and every mind and each and every heart. God wants to open your eyes to who He is and what He's doing right now in this very moment in your life. And I have no doubt about it. The question is, are we gonna open up our hearts tonight? Are we gonna expect that God wants to transform us? That God wants to refill us? Or maybe even what excites me, you're here tonight and you've never truly heard or understand or understood who God is and what this is all about. Well, I believe God will speak to you. And so would everyone close your eyes in this place? And Father, we just thank You for Your presence. Lord, we thank You for who You are. God, I thank You for every single individual life, Lord, that is here, that is in Hobart, that is online, wherever they might be, Father. And we just, we wanna welcome You again here now. God, I thank You that You are wanting to do something so good in each and every one of our lives. God, we again say that we love You tonight and we trust You. and We wanna have open hearts, Lord God, open ears, open eyes to see You to hear from You. I thank You that our strength to step out who You're calling us to be comes from You. And I pray that You would just reinvigorate every life, every heart, Father. We thank You for it. In Jesus' Name, if you believe it, would you shout Amen? Amen, amen. Amen. You guys can take your seats if you haven't already told the person next to you how grateful you are that you're sitting next to them now. Would be a very good opportunity. You know, I love the season that we are in as a church. I love that we've just come off two weekends that have been our vision and our mission Sunday. And it's so incredible that uh, we are entering into a new era. Everyone say new era. Or is it new era? You're both right. How good's that? Um, and I, I loved seeing these words over the last couple of weeks that us for a church are uh, on the brink at the start of a new era, but it's not just a nice, cute, cliche campaign words. I believe it's, tr- it's the truth. And I believe God is wanting to do something so brand new in our church. And we need to understand that the church isn't just this building that we're in today here at the Hills Campus or there in Hobart, but the church is us. The church is you. And I don't want to sit back or I want to encourage you not to sit back and spectate maybe a new era, but actually understand that this is an invitation to step into something new. It's going to happen in us and and we have the opportunity for it to happen in us. And there's something incredibly exciting about a new era, a new opportunity, something new. And I don't know if anyone remembers back on the eve of 2020, we were heading into a new era. It was a new decade. 
There was all the sayings, we're gonna have 2020 vision for 2020. It was so exciting. Anyone kind of remember going, this is cool. It's, it's 2019, tomorrow it's gonna be 2020. I remember I spent that New Year's Eve actually with our Hillsong United family. We were at, a, at this gathering, this Jesus gathering uh, in Atlanta in the United States of America. It's called Passion and it is incredible. And what makes it so incredible is that it's, it's just for a specific age group, just for college age kids. And it's incredible because people from all around the country come to this event and it's held in an indoor football stadium with over 70,000 people. And we got invited to come and worship in the new year. Now, I spend most of my New Year's Eves here in Australia, and I can tell you I've never led worship into a new year before. So I was like, oh, this could be cool. Wasn't sure to ex- what to expect. But it actually ended up being one of the most incredible uh, corporate worship experiences of my life. And they had literally asked us to sing in the new year. And they didn't just ask us to sing at the strike of midnight. They had a specific song that they asked us to do, and they had a specific moment that they wanted us to hit and they had planned fireworks to go off inside and outside of this place. And it was, it was incredible, but there was a bit of pressure on because they uh, asked us to do this song, Good Grace. I don't know if anyone remembers that. And there's this bridge and at the end, it goes into these big woes. You know, it's like, um, of course, I forget right now in front of you. I was fine in front of 70,000. But uh, it's like, um, let the praise go up as the walls go down. His name is Jesus. The drums ride and then it goes, whoa. That's so good, 45% are into this. It's amazing. And, um, and so right at that moment where we hit the big woes was when the fireworks were gonna go off because it was midnight and it was kind of stressful. So we knew we had to start the song at like 11, 56 and 24 seconds. But the good news is we started it on time and we hit midnight with the woes and it was just incredible. I don't know why you're clapping, but hey, if one claps, we all clap. It just makes everything feel better. And it couldn't have start, we couldn't have started 2020 on a better note. It was unbelievable, but it didn't take long for things to turn because the next song we decided, and this was only about an hour and a half before we were to go on stage to rewrite the lyrics to that old Irish folk song called Old Lang Syne. Anyone know that song? Oh, Scottish, sorry. And um, I actually don't know. I didn't do my research. So um, just got to be honest, it's church. And uh, I think it's Scottish. And... Um, and it's, it's a song that they would often sing at the start of a new year or at the start of a new era. And so someone had the bright idea like an hour and a half before, let's rewrite. The, it was kind of had a good theme, but let's really put Jesus into this. And so we rewrote the lyrics and then it came time to sing that. The first song after Good Grace, I were in, in Midnight. And of course, if you write a song like an hour or so before a, you go on stage, there's just a slight chance you're going to forget the lyrics. And lo and behold, that happened. And Ben Hastings, who is an Irishman and part of our team, he steps to start to sing this song and he goes, he has a mind blank. There's no words on the screen. There's a lot of people in the room and even more online. And he just doesn't know what to do, but he's got an Irish accent. So he just, he goes, no, I know what I'm going to do. He thickens up his Irish accent and starts going. And all the high and all the high for all the night and I. Anyway, and he just fumbles his way through the whole song. But also other things were starting to unravel and Joel was standing next to him and we have these in-ear monitors so we can kind of hear each other and his uh, monitors had, his pack had died out so he couldn't hear what was going on and he thought he'd buy himself some more time. And so as soon as the song finished and Ben like, you could see his shoulders drop with a sigh of relief, Joel runs forward to his mic. He's like, come on, sing it again. (laughs) And no word of a lie, he has to do the whole thing again. Then the next song, I'm, I, I don't know what it is. I tend to get excited when I praise God. It's, maybe it's because He's completely transformed my life. And so I, I just was jumping around, dancing, singing, having the best time. And there were some greats on the stage and my foot got caught in it and I broke my foot. And, and it just goes to show that Scripture is true. It says you reap what you sow. And we don't have time to go into it, but... Uh, quite a few years earlier, I actually jumped off a drum kit onto Phil Dooley's back and I broke his leg and I finally it caught up with me and my foot was broken on that night. But anyways, I think we can all agree that 2020 didn't get off to that start, that new era that I think we we're all expecting and maybe 2021 or 2022 didn't either. But yet we're on the brand new, we're in the edge of a brand new era and I wanna speak faith and hope tonight that all that God has ahead of us and all that He has promised. And 
The truth is life is full of surprises and there's some surprises that we welcome and we enjoy, but there are also some that we don't expect and that we didn't see coming. But what I wanna remind us tonight is that your and my heavenly Father who created us and has a purpose for us has never been surprised, that He is in control. There's never been a season, a moment that has caught Him off guard. And that's where our trust and that's where our faith is grounded in tonight. And that's what I wanna encourage each and every single one of us in. I don't just wanna inspire faith and hope, but I also want us to really practically tonight be able to walk away with some keys and ways that we can step into this incredible new era, into who God is calling us to be and all the incredible things that He has in store for us. And so if you're the title type of person, or another way, if you're just if you wanting to write a title tonight, the simple title of this message that I wanna encourage us is called First Things First. First Things First. And there's this incredible scripture in Matthew 6, verse 33. It says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, there are some Scriptures that you can kind of flick and pick and maybe get something out and they stand alone. But the reality is all of Scripture is really needed to be taken in context of what is really trying to be communicated. And so for us to really know and hear and understand what Jesus is actually saying here when He says, seek first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We need to go a few verses earlier to really see what is going on here. And we, if we jump into Matthew 6 verse 25, the title in my Bible is, Do Not Be Anxious. I like that. Do not be anxious. It's verse 25. Therefore I tell you, Jesus is speaking, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Why are you so anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive, um, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I love this passage. I love this scripture because it centres around our personal concerns like worry and anxiety and doubt that most of us can easily face. But I love it's got an incredible promise attached that as we seek first God's kingdom, that He will add all these things unto us anyway. This whole passage is ultimately talking about the reality that God is our source, that God is our provider. And it gives us an alternative, a different path to worry, stress and anxiety. I've heard it said that worry will try and have us continually crossing streams that don't exist. I saw that someone did a study about worry and anxiety and what it makes up. And so they interviewed and, and quizzed uh, a lot of people and came up with these results when they were digging into what do people actually worry about? And they found that 40% worry is made up, people's worry is 40% of it is made up of things that will never happen. 40% of what most people worry about are over things that actually won't happen. 30% is made up of things that are in the past that can't be changed. 30% of things that have already happened and we can't do anything about it. So you think about that. 40% about things that um, will never happen and 30% that, ha that's 70% of what people worry about are things that aren't gonna happen or have already happened that we can't do anything about. It says 12% are about criticism by others that are mostly untrue. So now we're up to 82%, 70% is things that, are, that won't happen or things that we can't change, 12% of, of criticism by people that it's not even warranted. So that's 82% of what people worry about. 10% is about health, which gets worse with worry. <laughs> 
So there you go, 92% of what people worry about. And then 8% of worry is about real problems that we have to face. And I don't know, I kind of feel like that's it's pretty accurate if you think about it. S.I. McMillan said that it's not work, but worry that makes us weary. And Jesus warns his disciples, he often did about worldly concerns and that how we counter them by seeking God and putting our trust in Him, our source, our provider. And I love this scripture. There's really three simple, three simple aspects that we can seek first the kingdom of God. And I think about this word of seeking and we know we find in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 29, 13, that it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I love the reality that God is to be found here tonight. God is to be found there at home or in Hobart, is that? God isn't hiding. God is there to be found if we wanna seek Him. But it says seek Him first. Order is important. Like you would never put Vegemite on toast before you've put the butter down. Order matters. What, how, how else could I illustrate that? It's impossible. Let's go home, we've got it. My daughter was trying to be really nice and make my wife a tea a little while ago and she put the tea bag in and then put the milk in there and just let it sit there. Like the order matters, you gotta put the, hot, the water in before the milk in a tea. I get, man, people are just, I don't know what it's like there at home, but this must be a big tea drinking community because people are just losing their minds at that realisation that you have to put the water in before the milk. We know that following the order matters. If you've ever put anything together from Ikea, uh, only a little while ago, we went to Ikea and got a chest of drawers. And there are some people, and there are very few, I only know two of them that know how to put something together without reading the instructions. And that is my wife and Jad Gillies. Um, I'm sure there's more here tonight, but um, it's kind of embarrassing what I have to call Jad to come and help me with. And, um, <laughs> but I'm gonna be honest, I am incredibly gifted. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but I cannot put things together. I don't, I'm not a handyman. And um, so we got this, these drawers from Ikea and, I was, and my wife, who is just, she doesn't even need instructions. She's incredible, was like, do you want some help? And I was like, nope, I have a point to prove here. And, um, and I was so excited because I, I, well, I thought I was following the instructions until I got to the last stage where I nailed on the back of the drawers and realised I couldn't figure out why I couldn't open the drawers. It's because I nailed the back to the front. But anyway, it doesn't matter. But order matters. We've got a God who can be sought, who we can seek and He wants to be found, but we need to do it first because order matters. And what are we seeking? We're seeking the kingdom. This is what Jesus came to establish. It's what He spoke about and it's what He lived. It's famously known as the upside down kingdom. It's an opposite way of living. It's completely different to the way of this culture and of this world, but it is the right way up. And it's the way that we are called to live. It's to seek first God's kingdom. So how do we do it? I wanna share some really practical ways that I believe we can actually live out our lives daily to seek first the Kingdom of God and overcome the worries and anxiety that could so easily distract us or try to take us out from the incredible plan and purpose that God has for you and that He has for me and that He has for our church. And these are not new ideas. They're ancient, but they're proven. They're, and they're also so obvious and basic that we know them. But my question is, do we do them? And I love our church mission. I love our vision uh, statement that we've been rallying around throughout last year and heading into this year to build a healthy church, changing lives through Christ. And so these are four, and there's more than four ways, but I wanna share four keys of how we can actually practically daily seek first the Kingdom of God. And I kind of like to call them healthy habits because if we're gonna build a healthy church, if we're gonna build our lives to be healthy, we need healthy habits. So you're ready for this. I kind of only go if we're all in. So uh, I'll just give you one more chance. Are you ready for this tonight? Whoa, did everyone just hear Hobart? That was crazy. Um, that guy. All right, the first healthy habit that I believe we can live lives to seek first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness and understand that all the things that we desire anyway that we'll receive from God and we can take a step away from anxiety and stress and worry. The first one is prayer. Everyone say prayer. I remember years ago hearing someone say, maybe the reason God isn't answering our prayers is because we're not praying them. I think about prayer and I think about how powerful this opportunity is that we have an opportunity to communicate with God. 
that God through His Word says that He doesn't just hear our prayers, but He listens and He can answer our prayers. I love that in this same chapter where Jesus is talking about teaching us to seek first His kingdom, He even teaches us how to pray. And I'm sure it's a prayer that we're all familiar with, but I thought it'd be great for us to read together the Lord's Prayer. And so it's gonna go on the screen. I've picked the version. We can all go around because we don't want that awkward moment where someone says, you know, uh, different. So, but hey, can we read this together? All right, come on, let's say this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your Name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. There is so much that we can learn even from this prayer alone. But I love that Jesus teaches us that how we pray matters. I don't know if you noticed in verse 10 that it says, when we're supposed to pray that it's my kingdom come, my will be done. Is anybody awake? Is anybody paying attention? Jesus teaches us that how we pray matters. That Do you notice we are meant to pray that Your kingdom come, not mine. That Your will be done. How we pray matters. And does it align with how Jesus teaches us to pray? Not only how we pray matters, but when we pray matters. I love this story and it is so clear and Jesus teaches us such an incredible lesson of of when we should pray. And it's found in Luke 18. And Jesus is telling a story, teaching us how to pray. And in Luke 18 verse one, Jesus told them, His disciples, a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. That's a bit of a hint of what this point is about. I'll say it again. Jesus is teaching them that it is necessary to pray consistently and never quit. He tells that there was a judge in a city who never gave a thought, who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. But there was a widow in that city and that widow kept after the judge saying, my rights are being violated, protect me. This judge, he never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and on, the judge says to himself, I care nothing about what God thinks and even less about what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm gonna end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. Then the master, Jesus says, do you hear that the judge corrupt as He is, is saying. So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for His chosen people who continue to cry out for help? Won't He stick up for them? I assure you He will. He will not drag His feet. You ready to be challenged? But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when He returns? It's a rhetorical question, don't shout it out. Jesus is teaching us to pray consistently and never quit. And then Jesus is asking though, but how, like, how much of that persistent faith am I gonna find on earth? Can I tell you that your prayers don't expire unless you stop praying them. I love that in our services, it is important. And we, we do, we pray before the service, we pray, pray during the service, but even our prayer requests, those people that, take time to fill in a prayer request. I love that still our pastors, we gather around every Tuesday in the city and we pray over the prayer request from the weekend because we understand that prayer is not just a one-time ticket that expires once you've finished talking. No, prayer only expires when we stop praying. And I wanna encourage you, Jesus is so clear in teaching us if we're gonna seek His Kingdom first, that we have this opportunity to communicate, to commune with Him. And let's be the people that pray how Jesus taught us to pray, that He will have His way, that His will will be done and that it's His Kingdom that comes. And can I encourage you tonight, maybe you're here tonight and you're like me, that you've known for years and years and years that prayer is powerful and that it's important. But maybe when you hear this story that Jesus taught His disciples, thousands of years ago that maybe we could all step up our prayer life and our commitment to pray consistently and never quit. I don't know, I've been challenged lately when we can often get texts from people and you reply back, I'm, um, I'm gonna pray for you or praying for you. I'm trying to change it and say, I prayed for you. You ready for the second healthy habit? If we're gonna, how can we actually seek first God's kingdom? Through His Word. You know, it's so easy for us to rely on our pastors 
or our, whoever's spiritually guiding us or a podcast to, to feed us the Word of God. And there is a place for that and it is incredible. And I'm so honoured that I get able to encourage you around God, God's Word tonight. But I wanna encourage you that our Father wants to personally speak to you. And there are many and any ways that God can speak. But I'll tell you from my experience, I think the most obvious and uh, incredibly accessible way to hear God is through His Word. And I believe if we're going to be able to seek God first, His kingdom and His righteousness, and be able to overcome the worries and the anxiety and things that are trying to really distract us and get us off course, is we need to make the decision to listen to God's voice, to listen to God's Word. Like imagine if I was to tell you tonight here that after the service, God Himself in the flesh is going to be in one of the lecture rooms over there for two and a half hours. We've got 15 minute slots and you get a one-on-one conversation with God. I tell you what, they would just be, you'd probably leave right now and like go, I'm gonna go line up because I don't wanna miss out. But can I tell you through God's Word that we have an opportunity to hear from Him any moment in any day that we want to. I love it. And for me personally, last year, there, it was the incredible year that it was. It was God's Word and standing on His Word was really the only thing that got me through some of the challenges and beautiful surprises that I didn't see coming. And it was a Scripture like Psalm 119, verse 105, where it says, you, I'm sure you know it, it says, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Can I tell you that it is absolutely is. When there's those seasons and moments where it actually seems dark and you don't know which way is forward or it seems a bit foggy, that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a lot, literally a light unto our path. I know there's a lot of youth crew here tonight. Anyone in high school, fuel wildlife, what I'm about to say is gonna get you so excited. I've got some homework for you. But don't worry, I've got homework for everybody else there. Eddie in Hobart loves homework, but... Uh, <laughs> but that, that was just one, one verse in Psalm 119 that talks about God's Word, a lamp unto our feet. I wanna encourage you, even tonight, or set your alarm, put a reminder tomorrow, just read Psalm 119. Don't worry, it's only 176 verses. <laughs> but in Psalm 119 alone, it teaches us so much. We see that His Word, it helps us to live pure. It lights our dark, park, our dark pathways. It shows us His promises, His benefits. It gives us strength to stand against sin. It deepens our relationship and it helps us discover God's kingdom and teaches us who and we're called to be and how we're called to live. And that's just one chapter. The Word of God is living and it's breathing and it's acting. And can I tell you, it is the way that we can actually seek God first is through His Word. And I know even throughout last year, I got the, um, with a bunch of guys, formed the Connect Group where we would just read the Bible every single day. And I can tell you, it's, those moments have been what has sustained me. And now my goal is, and I, is to not just read the Bible every day, but, but for it to be the first thing that I read and challenge myself, what is God saying to me? And sometimes I'll read the chapter and I get nothing. And so I'll read it again. And I've never not got something out of God's Word. You ready for number three? So I believe if we're gonna seek first the kingdom of God, how are we gonna do it? We're gonna, we're gonna be praised, but consistent praise. We're gonna be in God's Word. Number three is we're gonna know how to worship. I've heard worship described as one of the words is worship. It's putting worth on God. Worship simply helps us acknowledge God's kingdom by admitting that He is the King of His kingdom and not us. And I want to encourage you, please, please do not miss out on the incredible encounters of worship you can have by thinking that worship is just limited to 20 minutes in a service once a week. You know, by far the most incredible moments of worship I've ever had with God have been by myself in my bedroom or in my car. I have had some pretty incredible moments of worship in this room as well but the most incredible moments of worship I've had is when I have just sought God and honoured Him as King of the Kingdom, not me. And I don't know if I, how, I, how we can think that we can do this journey on our own. And worship is a powerful moment. Worship invites the presence of God into our lives. And, and when we worship, we experience the Kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And, I love Psalm 34, verse four and nine. It says, God met me more than halfway. 
He freed me from my anxious fears. Look at Him. Give Him your warmest smile. Could you give me your warmest smile? Come on. Trust me, you'll only feel better if you smile. That's a good smile, Lucinda. Darren Kiddo, one of the best. Lynn Ollis, Steve Ollis, Terry Scott. Wow. I can only see your top front of teeth. Go lower. I want all to full thing. Look at Him and give Him your warmest smile. It's okay to go before God with your fears and your doubts and your frustrations. God's big enough to accept that. But it says that we are to look at Him, give Him your warmest smile. I promise you, if you smile, you, never, you won't feel any worse. Never hide your feelings from Him. Do you understand that we have a God that we can come before and worship as we are? We don't have to wait till we have it all together and, you know, got four Sundays in a row at church. No, we get to come before God as we are. He says, when I was desperate, I called out and God got me out of a tight spot. God's angels set up a circle of protection around us while we pray. Open your mouth and taste. Open your eyes and see how good God is. Worship God if you want the best. Worship opens the doors to all His goodness. And I want to encourage us tonight. How do we actually seek God's kingdom and His righteousness first? Let's come first to Him and pray. Let's hear from Him in His Word and then let's put the worth back on Him and worship Him for who He is. And the third and final, oh, the fourth and final thing, and I don't know if the team want to come and join me. And I love this one. How can we actually live lives that seek God and honour Him? Number four is thankfulness thankfulness, gratitude. Be grateful for what we have actually received. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 and 8. Listen to this. I believe this is going to encourage you. Isn't everything you have and everything you are sheer gifts from God? Isn't everything you have and everything you are a sheer gift from God? So what's the point of all the comparing and competing? You already have all you need. You already have more access to God than you can handle. We have been given so much. I'm pretty simple, but if I'm breathing, I'm really happy. Because if I wasn't, isn't everything that you have, everything that you are a gift from God? How often do we lose perspective of that? Yeah. And I want to remind us tonight, we have so much to be thankful for. We don't always choose our circumstance. We know that, but we can always choose how we respond. And I want to encourage us, let's respond with gratitude and thankfulness. My incredible wife, Lauren and I, last, uh, last year, we just developed this saying and it's kind of a little bit kind of corny and whatever, but it's actually been the best thing ever. And whenever something happens or whenever we feel like there's just, there's, it's just too hard or it's too big of a challenge or we don't know how we're gonna get through something and we just see of what, we just focus on, get caught up in what we don't have and, and what we can't do. And we just stop and we look at each other and we say, we have so much to be grateful for. And we just, we speak that over each other's lives because it's the truth. Like she's married to me. I just can't, but I don't know how she did it. She's so lucky. <laughs> we have so much to be grateful for. Being happy doesn't make you grateful, but being grateful will always bring that happiness that everyone is pursuing. We seem to have more anxiety, depression and fear than any other generation. And yet we have more than any other generation, more access to information, more technology and I know anxiety and worry, it's not a new thing and maybe it's been the same through all of time, but that's just the way I see things. And we all, can, we all have seen it before. We look at people who seem to have everything and yet we tend to see their lives showing that they aren't happy and that they aren't fulfilled. But there are also people who have great misfortune and they're incredibly happy. You know, the happiest kids I've ever seen in my life was... A few years ago, we were in Rwanda and we're on a bus driving out to this remote village about two hours from the, 
from the capital city and were driving past these kids and they were playing soccer and they were the happiest kids I've ever seen. But they, they were playing soccer, but there was no grass. They didn't even have any grass. It was just dirt. And they didn't even have a soccer ball. They'd basically found plastic rubbish and some rope and tied it up and yet they were so happy and fulfilled. I mean, Psalm 100, I'm sure you know it. It says that we enter God's courts, His presence, with thankfulness, with gratitude in our hearts. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, let us be grateful. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. The Bible is so clear that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So let's not be shaken when things are shaking around us. But let's remind ourselves, as Hebrews says, that Let's be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is how we're gonna seek God first. It's by acknowledging and being grateful for what we have actually received. And the fact is that we have so much to be grateful for. And I'm not trying to belittle maybe the lack and the challenges and the misfortune that has happened to anyone here tonight. But what I do wanna remind you is that I promise you we have so much to be grateful for. And I pray that becomes our language. Seeking Jesus first, not last. Going to prayer first, going to His Word first, going to worship first, going to gratitude first. The very next Scripture in Matthew 6, verse 34 says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I love how the message translation paraphrases this. It says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. And can I encourage us tonight? Can I lift our faith, which we need to stir up the faith, stir up what God has put in us as we are on the verge and we've entered into a new era as a church that can we be expectant? Can we be the kind of people? Let's build these healthy habits and just seek first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness and understand that all the things that we're gonna worry about anyway will be added unto us as we put Him first, as we continually and consistently go to prayer, knowing that the answers are found in Him, as we let Him speak to us through His Word, as we continually worship Him for who He is and look at Him, give Him our warmest smile, understand that we can actually taste and see that He is a good God and that we have so much to be grateful for. And can I encourage us even more practically that we just do it one day at a time. I love New Year's resolutions. I normally get almost 48 hours out of mine. But my New Year's resolution this year was to have a New Day's resolution, that every single day that I'd seek first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness, because that's the thread of the Bible. It teaches us in Exodus how God, He, he provided manna daily for His people. In Lamentations, we're promised new mercies every day. As we even read in the Lord's Prayer, that we are to ask for our daily bread. So when we face a situation that seems overwhelming, and we could easily drift towards hopelessness or despair. But instead, when times are tough or when times are good, and especially if we're tempted to worry or think anxious thoughts, let's remember to seek first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness and know that everything that He will add unto us. Could we stand tonight in this place and there in Hobart? I just wanna read this. Uh, Matthew 6, 34 again. Because I believe God is wanting to remind us tonight to re-stir that faith that we would be energised in who He is and who He's calling you to be. Let's give our entire attention to God. Could we close our eyes in this place just so you can really let, I believe the Holy Spirit is here and He is actually wanting to just refill some, maybe, you're here tonight and you only just got here, just, you've used all the energy and faith that you had. Well, I believe that not me, not a message, not a song, but the presence of the living God wants to refill 
re-energise your soul and your heart and your desire to follow the call of God that He has for your life. So let's give our entire attention to what God is doing right now in this very moment. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God is gonna help you and I deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. We thank You, Jesus, for Your Word. Oh, we thank You for how much You love us, how much You care, how much You are so much more in control than we're ever gonna realise, Lord. And I just thank You for everyone that's gathered here. God, I pray that You would remind them who You are, that You would remind us who You are, God. And as we step into these new days, Lord, that You would teach us, that You would lead us, that You would guide us, that we would seek You first, Your Kingdom and Your righteousness. And I thank You for the strength that You give us on the journey. God, I thank You that there is new mercies for us today. I thank You tomorrow morning then when we wake up and have to walk out whatever tomorrow holds, God, that Your mercies are there that Your grace is there. And we ask that You would speak to us louder than You ever have before, clearer than You ever have before, God. We love You, Jesus. Lift up His name, Jesus, the light of heaven, worthy. Jesus, the King is risen. He reigns in grace and power. Worthy of praise forever. Oh, nothing less than my own. Oh, I surrender my own to Him. Lift up His name. Jesus, the
such a powerful prayer to sing that I surrender my all to Him. That's my heart's prayer, that we would live surrendered to Him. Tonight, if you're here or if you're joining us in Hobart or online, I wanna make sure that nobody misses out on truly being able to pray and sing and confess this, that you would surrender all that you are to Jesus, to seek Him first. And the first step in that journey is to accept Him. And I want everyone to close your eyes in this moment, just so you're not distracted and you can think about where do you stand when it comes to Jesus? I'm sure that there are many here tonight that would say, I've accepted Jesus. I love Him and I'm on this journey and it is a journey. But maybe you're here tonight and there's never been that specific moment that you've decided to say, yes, I accept you, Jesus. I believe in who you are and what you did. And maybe that's because you've never truly understood who Jesus is or what He did or even why He did what He did. The reason that Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice on the cross is so that we could find forgiveness. Forgiveness from our past and our mistakes and be released from that and actually live in freedom. Live in freedom with His grace and His mercy that is with us every single step of the way. His love that is unconditional. Jesus loves us and He accepts us just the way that we are. And the only thing that we need to do is accept Him. But He also loves us too much to leave us how He finds us. So He invites us on this journey of discovering who He is and who He's calling us to be. And if you're here tonight and you've never decided to accept Jesus, it would be my greatest honour to lead you in a simple prayer that starts this whole journey off of following Jesus. And if you're here tonight and you wanna say, this is my night, I wanna make this decision or for whatever reason, Maybe you're here tonight and at some stage you've prayed that prayer, but you've kind of lost your way and you've turned your back on your relationship with God. I just wanna remind you, He has never turned His back on you. You find tonight when you turn back to Him, you're gonna be welcomed with open, loving, accepting arms. But if that's you tonight, if you wanna come back and recommit your life to Jesus or accept Him for the very first time, just so I know who I'm praying for, every eye's closed, we don't wanna embarrass you, but I wanna know who I'm praying for. If that's you and you want me to include you in this prayer, why don't you raise your hand when I count to three? One, two, three. Raise your hand if you know this is your moment. That's incredible. Thank you. I see that hand. Whether you're in Hobart or wherever you might be, we don't want anyone to miss out on this gift of salvation. I'm going to pray this prayer. It starts this journey off. And we're a family. We want to pray with you. So I'm going to ask everyone to repeat this after me. Come on, nice and loud. Say, Jesus, I thank You that You love me. I thank You that You died on the cross and You rose again for me. I'm sorry that I've sinned against You. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Give me a brand new start. I thank You that You now live in me and I'll follow You the rest of my days. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we, uh, we're clapping and we want to congratulate You because I truly believe it's the greatest decision that you could ever made and we want to make sure you know if you raised your hand if, even if you didn't put your hand up but you prayed that prayer and you you know that was your moment we want to give you a free gift of the Bible and can I tell you praying that prayer is the very start but it's not until we read this book the word point number two that we actually start to discover who God is and this incredible clear way of life and there's a um We'd love to get in contact with you and help you anyway. We never want to hassle you. We want to help. So if there's a way we can do that, please let us know. But church, I love you. Anyone have faith for the days ahead? Come on, anyone have faith for what God wants to do in your life, in our church? Amen. I do, and I'm excited about it.